Well, I thought if I was uh, playing the role of tour guide, then it only made sense that I maybe dress up a little bit for you. Um, and, and notice, by the way, I've actually, like, well, you'll notice in a second that I've worn a shirt that matches the slides. How many other MOOC guys do that kind of, you know, give you that kind of service? <laughs> All right, so we were um, in, the, in the sort of lower subcortical regions of the brain. We're now going to move to the cortex, so we're kind of going to go move up, but in this case, back, right to the sort of back of the skull, and we're going to explore an area called the occipital lobes, uh, and while we're there, we'll learn a few general principles of brain functioning. Let's do it. All right, week two, lecture four, the occipital lobe. Um, yeah, you see eyes all over the place because the occipital lobe is about vision. Um, this gives you a sense of where we're talking about, right at the very back of the brain. Um, and, and literally, it seems kind of always seemed odd to me, at least as a student, that you know visual input that was coming in from the eyes would actually be processed way back here. That you, the track would go through the entire brain before it got to the part that processed it. But for whatever reasons, that's that's how our brains are wired. Um, so we have this visual information coming in. It follows the optic nerve. It passes through this interesting area called the lateral geniculate nucleus, often just. Uh, acronymed as LGN. Um, the lateral geniculate nucleus is interesting because uh, a lot of our sensory information goes through it. And uh, you know, one supposition is that this is what kind of prioritizes what we are attending to at any given moment, be it vision, sound, taste, touch, etc. Um, but once it goes through the lateral geniculate nucleus, it then goes on to first what we're going to call primary visual cortex, and then more and more, there's, there's different visual areas. So the information kind of starts at the very back here in this primary cortex and then moves forward through the brain um, up to what we call association cortex or secondary cortex. So this is one interesting distinction I, I want to um, use this lecture for. Uh, and it's a distinction between what we're going to call sensation and what we're going to call perception. Uh, it's always a tricky distinction for students to get, but, but I hope I'll be able to make it clear for you. The primary visual cortex is getting the raw input from the world. So just, you know, literally the information from the eyes is going right here. And if you had damage to, to this area, what would literally, what you would feel phenomenologically is that you had like a black spot on it. Almost like, you know, if you took my glasses and stuck a sticker on it somewhere so that that visual information um, just wasn't getting in any information that hit that that's what it would feel like if if some of your neural tissue here was damaged you would have what we call a scotoma um, literally a kind of a black spot that followed your vision anywhere you looked so it's really about the basic visual information but as we move up through cortical areas it becomes more about the interpretation of that visual information because if you take a moment and look at, look at uh, introspect on your raw visual input and ask yourself kind of as you look around how many whole and complete objects do I see? Uh, chances are most of the objects as you look around your world will be either occluded by other objects you know something's in front of them so really you're only seeing part of it um, or for one reason or another, you know, maybe it would be peeking out around a corner or something like that, we very seldom get these really clean presentations of things to us. The world presents stimuli embedded in noise, and I've mentioned that before. So perception is about taking that raw input and figuring out what's really there. And that requires, of course, knowledge about objects, requires memory. You know, literally, you have to have seen some of these objects before um, in order to be able to recognize them when you only see a portion of them. So there's this fine interplay between raw sensory input and memory that leads to what we call perception. Okay, so let's get into that a little bit. And I want to give you that with this example. This is an example I've used in my class for years. Most of you, I suspect, can read this perfectly fine. Um, the cat in the hat. Now what's interesting about this example is all of the H's and all of the A's are in fact the exact same stimulus. So if you look at this H, for example, and this A, um, I have literally copied and pasted that same stimulus here and of course in hat right back to back. 
the H and the A. And yet sometimes, even though it is always the same raw input, sometimes we see it, that is, we perceive it, as either an H or an A. Right? Here it looks like an H, here it looks like an A. Why? Well, this shows the richness that, that goes on in the brain um, as we take a raw input and then start to interpret it. W there's issues like context, right? There's the letters around it. Now, literally, you know, if you take something like Taekwondo, um, this could be T-A-E. You know, from some perspectives, that would be a reasonable stimulus. But even then, Thai, even if we think of the bigger per uh, perceptual thing, if this had said Quan and this had said Do, then we would probably see that as an A. But this says cat in the hat. And so now the, I just sounded like William Shatner there. The cat in the hat. Sorry, I had a little William Shatner um, sharing with a Canadian moment. Um, but with that context, all of that context, so our brain is, is taking in this raw input, but it's taking it in and it's combining it all and ultimately trying to make sense out of the noisy input. And that's what the brain does really, really well. Um, and so ultimately, it doesn't matter to the brain that these letters look the same visually. It will perceive them differently um, because it will make them fit with previous experiences. We don't know a word C-H-T, but we know a word C-A-T. And so it makes more sense to the brain to see that as an A. Okay, that's sensation versus perception. We'll run into that in other parts of the course but this is a good chance to introduce it. Now, there's weird things that can happen um, when this process gets blocked in some ways. Uh, there's a form of, of visual impairment, um, yeah, acquired brain disorder called visual agnosia. Um, for a visual agnosia, agnos for someone suffering from visual agnosia, their vision is still fine. They can see things perfectly well. But what they have problems with is that interpretation process I've just been talking about. So in one classic example, a patient was shown a glove. They were shown something like this. They weren't allowed to touch it. They were just shown it for a distance. So all they had was visual information. And they were asked, what do you think this is? And so the patient looked at it very carefully and said something like, hmm, let me see. Well, it's got these little pouches here. Um, so it's like some sort of purse thing, maybe, that people could carry with little pouches. I know, maybe they put coins of different sizes in these different pouches. Okay, so what this patient is doing is trying to figure this out. They, they see it perfectly fine. The visual input is there. But it's the trying to put that visual inf information together into something that makes sense. And sometimes they will get confused. They will figure things out and they will go down a wrong path like that patient I just told you about. Now if you gave her this, if you let her feel it, then immediately she'd grab it and probably put it on her hand and go, oh yeah, it's a glove. You know, the tactile sense senses can figure out what it is, um, but the visual sense cannot. So kind of a fascinating thing. Now there, there's a, a famous book on this by a, a neuropsychologist named Oliver Sacks. And that book is called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Um, the title of that book, the book is full of a bunch of short stories of different forms of brain damage and the phenomenology they produce. Fascinating book. I highly recommend it. Um, in the case of The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, he was literally meeting with Dr. Sachs, and then on his way out, he was looking for his hat, and his wife was still sitting in the couch, and her hair looked hat-like to him. So he reached out and grabbed her head, um, mistaking his wife for a hat. So, you know, that's, that's the title story of that book, and it's all about visual agnosia. If you're interested, check that out. Um, all right, so, you know, quick little tour of the occipital lobe, uh, and we're going to continue this with the various other parts of the brain. Here's some other things for you to check out. Here's a video about sensation and perception to, again, try to highlight that distinction more and make that more clear to you. Um, this one's kind of, I threw this in kind of funny. This is obviously a school project. It's two young girls describing the occipital lobe and what it does. Um, when I looked at this, it had about 100 hits. Uh, so I thought it would be kind of funny to mention it to you guys and, and maybe 
you know, pump that up 10,000 or 20,000 or so, because I suspect the little girls would get quite a kick out of it in their classroom would too. So a, a fun example that, hey, when you put something on the internet, the world's watching. So if you feel so inclined, check it out. There's some good information there too. They do a good job. Um, this is a link to tell you more about the man who mistook his wife for a hat. Um, I, I would suggest that if you want to read something along with the course, this is a great thing to read because it's short little stories. You can read one before you go to bed. And really by learning about weird things that happen when, when there's damage to the brain, you learn a lot about what those parts of the brain normally do for most of us. So, so really good. Check it out. And then here's um, a, a website that's more about the occipital lobe itself. Um, gives you a little bit more information about that. Um, so check that out and we will continue the tour.